Good afternoon. Well, this is going to be a great roundtable. We tried in the first roundtable to dance around talking about the future, but every single conversation pulled into the future. Uh, so this afternoon, we're going to get to talk about that. And I want to introduce, I'm going to have Julie Albright give a, a uh, opening statement of some duration. Because when she spoke at DCD Enterprise in New York in March, she lit a fire under that room, she keynoted. And she had some of the biggest names in our business on a panel. And then before you knew it, she was speaking to management groups at Uber and at Google and at Microsoft. And it's continued on from there because what she has to say is so profound. And if you have any idea what the edge is going to look like from outside the edge, what it's, what's coming at us at a rate that we can't imagine, it really is Julie who has a bead on it, has written a book about it, which is about to be published. Uh, she's a digital sociologist. She also lectures at the Vitterby School of Engineering at USC. And her field is helping us all understand what the world of social media really means and how quickly our DNA is changing. So, Julie, if you would come up and deliver that from here, we'd be very appreciative. Julie Albright. Thank you. Well, thank you for having me, and thank you to this illustrious panel. I can't wait to talk to you all about these issues. All right. So from the last panel, I heard a lot of talk about consumers and consumer behavior and, and things like that. And you know, it occurs to me that technologies do not exist in a vacuum. Would you agree with that statement? So it, technologies exist in a context. And I'm going to talk today a little bit about that context and about some of the key trends that are happening. I laughed as I arrived here last night. I saw Encore behind us, uh, Encore Energy. I spoke there about five years ago, and I started talking about these issues about uh, mobility, about social media, about the changing society and the changing consumer. And one of the older gentlemen, the older, uh, I think he's a vice president over there, he's retired now, raised his hand. He says, Jewel, is this just a fad? You know, so uh, it, he couldn't really believe that this was so transformative of society, but certainly it's not a fad. And technologies, as we know, have intended consequences, things we want them to do, and unintended consequences. Who would have known, say, five, 10 years ago, that we would be talking about social media perhaps transforming our very democracy, right? So these are not uh, just throwaway issues. They're very central to who we are and where we're going. So I call this coming untethered. Uh, we just talked about uh, my books that's going to be coming out this next year on that topic. And what we're talking about here is how consumers are changing. So I'm just going to give you a quick glimpse into this idea and what's happening. Coming untethered basically means the ties to people and traditional processes and social structures that shape our society. You can think about things like churches or political parties, for example are people are coming unhooked from those things or untethering from those things. And it's, these things are being displaced by hyper-attachment to digital technologies. That's where you guys come in. So this is an example of coming untethered. You might think about the post-baby uh, boom and, and post-World War II, uh, the American dream. You know, that, that get that stake in the dream, right? Buy a house, get married have 2.5 kids and a car and the dog and all that. Remember this whole idea, right? Younger folks are completely unhooking from this. I just saw a startling statistic, by the way, a couple days ago. And by the way, average, uh, if we roll back to post-World War II, average age at marriage at that time was about 20 for females, about 22 for men, right? A lot of people married their high school sweethearts, right? Does that make sense? Now. 65% of teenagers, get that number, not 5%, 65% of 
have never been in a relationship at all. So think about what that means. So they're unhooking from getting married. They're unhooking from buying homes. They're unhooking from even getting a driver's license as teens, many teens. That was a sort of a stepping stone toward adulthood, toward autonomy, right? And so this whole, everything about this digital economy and, and mobility is transforming their very lives and their goals, their aspirations, and their values. So. Uh, this is just one example. This is a, a group called uh, Common, and uh, everything is becoming ephemeral. So this is sort of a live workspace. This one happens to be in Brooklyn, but these are popping up all over the place. You show up with your bag, your backpack or whatever it is with your clothes, and that's it. All the furniture's there. You eat in a shared space. You uh, socialize in a shared space. They actually have like residential advisors there, planning outings, like maybe you're going to go on a ski trip for the day. So this is, idea is, it's almost like a college dorm. Did any of you live in the dorms in college? Remember that experience? So it's like they're extending adolescence into young adulthood now. And the funniest thing about this, and this is going into telecom and all these other industries, there's no commitment. So if you get this room and you don't like it, you want another room, oh no, you can switch rooms. Oh, you don't like this building? You can go to another building, no problem. No contract, no commitment of any kind. So that's one of the things that's happening. Unhooking, moving, transiting. One of my friends is a tech entrepreneur in LA. He moved four times a year ago, just because. So this idea of not, think about the 30-year mortgage and buying a home and what that means and being rooted in a community. Remember they used to call men that were, you know, standard bearers, they call them the pillar of the community, right? Pillars, standing there holding up the community. So this idea of not being a pillar, but just being ephemeral, you know, now here today, gone tomorrow, relationships are that way, living spaces are that way, all of it. And this is all a result of, uh, you know, of course there's ec economic factors that underlie, you know, sort of driving this, but digital technologies enable this kind of ephemerality that I'm talking about. Also, by the way, the, another point on this is careers. Average length is about two years. So this constant churn rate, and that's gonna impact everybody in this room. How do you have employees that are gonna stick around? What do you do? Or are they just gonna continually churn? And it costs a lot of money to get them up to speed. I don't know if you saw this artist's work, but he took uh, photos and then he uh, photoshopped out the cell phones to show the impact of what that is. And there's a whole series of this, it's called Removed. But I thought it was quite interesting. But here's the thing, smartphones, for younger people in particular, have become another appendage. Uh, most people, or many people now, are sleeping with their smartphones, but if you get to the younger group, 90% of 18 to 29 year olds are sleeping with their smartphones so as never to miss a message. And what's happening now is that younger people are getting used to communicating through a device, which means mediated communication, not face-to-face. -face. And that's having some interesting and somewhat negative impacts in a way. Uh, one, they would rather communicate through that device than call somebody. A lot of business people, sales, they're having trouble with that because a, a younger millennial, for example, doesn't want to call someone on the phone. In fact, some of these big companies like JP Morgan or Coke, they're actually eliminating voicemail because people aren't checking them and they're not returning the calls. So only 6% of the people wanted to uh, maintain voicemail. In fact, some millennials are even saying a phone call is distasteful or sort of a negative experience. It's obtrusive on their time. They'd rather that you text. I had, I'm a, I teach at USC in Los Angeles and have taught all kinds of classes, won all kinds of teaching awards. One of my grad students in psych this uh, last spring, I thought this was very telling, said, uh, she made eye contact with me in class and it made me uncomfortable. Made eye contact in class, just like this. So, so think about what that means when the unmediated communication between humans is becoming uncomfortable or becoming obtrusive or something like that. The face-to-face, -face, the voice-to-voice, -voice, and the digital technology, they want that interface between those relationships. Digital technologies are changing other things as well, and I just you know, wanted to think about what this may mean. The pace of life. 
In other words, there are now babies growing up, uh, learning how to use digital devices like iPads before they acquire language. We're actually rewiring the brains of kids at this point. So these kids have a different expectation in terms of pacing. You know, it's kind of a don't care, uh, don't care how I want it now type of thing. Uh, my friend was watching, uh, t you know, my friends tell me these stories as, as this story of being untethered uh, unfolds. And he said, I was watching 2001, A Space Odyssey. I wanted to expose my kid to it. And after a while, he goes, well, what do you think? He was all excited. And the kid said, well, 11 minutes in and they're still monkeys. You know, it, it made my friend realize that, yeah, there are monkeys 11 minutes in. In other words, the pacing, what seemed like back then, the 70s or 80s, seemed perfectly fine and very gripping and interesting. And now the kids are like, Pfft. and so he was texting to the point the guy had to keep saying, hey, there's something about to happen on the screen. So kids aren't watching TVs these days. Older people are watching it. They are unhooking, they're multitasking. So this idea that television isn't interactive uh, so how uh, we can get things to be more interactive. The second piece is that, and the other thing I hear people say is, well, digital transformation happened, or transformation happened, let's say, you know, back in the industrial era with horses and into cars. Uh, my great-great-grandfather had said to um, someone that 25 miles an hour is fast enough for anybody when the cars came out originally. So this idea that people went from horses to cars but the pace of change was you know, slow, generations sometimes slow. And now the churn rate is so fast for digital technologies. It's hard for us to even think eight years into the future here. That's the future as opposed to like a 50 year time horizon. So this idea that the pace of change, particularly for younger people and what they expect and what they're used to is very different than older people and what they expect and are used to. And some people will not be able to keep up. So last but not least here in terms of just thinking about um, where we're going, we talked about uh, coming untethered. We're coming unhooked from these traditional ways of doing things here in this country and increasingly globally as well, by the way. Now we've got two things happening on the horizon and we can talk about these ideas with the panel today. One is of course IoT and what I'm calling the internet of me, right? It's all customized to you. I come into a room and the thermostat adjusts exactly to the temperature that I like or you like. You know, everything's, you know, the music wells up and the lights come on when you come home, that idea. It's personalized to you. Also that idea of the quantified self that we're measuring everything now, heart rate, steps, number of steps that we took a day, for example. And then we're moving toward now and what's coming up and emerging on our horizon is what I call the internet of them. This is human, out of the loop, autonomous, embedded intelligence in an increasing number of devices, robotics, automation, which is going to be transformative of many industries and uh, customer behaviors and, and all that. So. Um, we have with that sort of an end of jobs problem. Uh, we may discuss that uh, a bit later with our uh, group. So uh, thank you for being here and listening and thinking about these issues. Uh, I love this just married and they're just completely focused on their phones here, <laughs> not even looking at one another. Uh, I'm going to uh, kick it off with the panel here today. I'm so excited about this group um, and thanks for having me. All right, guys. So we're going to talk about the future. And I warned some of these folks that uh, we might talk about it in a little bit more of an out-of-the-box way. So fasten your seatbelts uh, <laughs> in terms of what we'll be um, focusing on today. We are moving, uh, as you can see from some of this, from an industrial era or industrial cities to a digital era and digital cities. And you guys are really creating uh, backbone, or you could think about it now as uh, the circulatory system, right? You're the heart, the beating heart of everything that we just talked about. And the circulation is that data going out into more and more devices and more and more things. And it's really transformative. So I mentioned this idea that these devices and connectivity, it's a key value, particularly to younger people. And this expectation now that uh, we have an always on, always available society. Uh, over there now in Puerto Rico, you've probably been watching some of the post-hurricane issues going on. 
uh, they are desperately seeking Wi-Fi, and, and that's what they're looking for now. And, and you know, you think about as more and more things become connected, you know, there is this uh, um, understanding or thought that they're always going to be there. Now, this is an amazing panel. I'm so thrilled to be here with them. But they all come from different perspectives, right? So it's kind of like the blind man and the elephant. You know, everybody's coming at this and seeing it a different way, which I think is exciting because, you know, when we get all the blind men and the elephant and women, two of us, um, yeah, we'll get a fuller picture of what's going on. So from the blind man and the elephant um, perspective, I wanted to ask um, you all, what in your view are the key challenges from your industry, from your perspective, posed by this digital transformation that we're talking about and untethering? Do you want to um, start us off? Sure. Great. And, uh, thank you for that uh, thought-provoking presentation, because I started, <laughs> thank you for getting the notepads, because I started making notes. So I'm like, I don't even know where to go with this. But I'm going to go with the pace of change. Yeah. Um, you know, my wife and I went to Egypt a few years ago, and I, I, I'm a civil engineer by education. I got to see the pyramids, and I always thought in my brain they're going to be disappointing, but they're not. So go if you can go. Oh gosh. Um, but you pace, right? So you know, hundreds of years, somebody, a pharaoh, had an idea. I want to create these, and then they had generations of people that built these, and you know, they they were okay with that pace. And then you just you know put that up there. And you know, from the the human perspective, when we talk about IoT or the edge, and you know the for me, it's the adoption, right? It's that human factor of when people embrace these things is when that paradigm shift happens. And oftentimes, it's either, as we know it today, we call it a, some viral event, right? Something right. that kind of, as Malcolm Gladwell said, someone referenced him earlier, the tipping point, right? You hit that tipping point, and all of a sudden, it's, you know, it's the mode of the day. Right. Um, but you know, in edge and in IoT, I think we're seeing challenges with cybersecurity and what are the benefits. And we talked about some of these sociological impacts. But it's the when when there is that use case and somebody has the proof in the pudding, then adoption tends to grow. And as a vendor, right, we're always trying to do things like this, be thought leaders, and you know, try to lead customers down this path. Right. These are all the great benefits you're going to have, but. At the end of the day, they want that proof, right? So it's case studies, it's you know, having example customers that will come up and testify that the stuff works, but it really has to have that impact. You know, it's, it's driving that change. So as I see these things happen, you know, it's that challenge of how do you get people to really say, what does it mean to me, and not be the, I don't want to be the first, you know, I don't want to be the first one, I don't yeah. want to be, you know, the You always king. want to be the second one to innovate. Right, right. right. Is so that right? Utilities. From, oh, from my perspective, that. this whole pace thing really drove the, you know, it's, it's marketing. How do you change people's minds, right? How do you get into their head and say, this is going to be something good for you? And sometimes the tastemakers of the world, somebody referenced the Kardashians earlier, they drive these, what we wouldn't consider normal behaviors because they become for whatever reason, a tastemaker. Yeah. Vendors, we're always trying to do that. Uh, and, and technologies are starting to really influence how people change their mind, right? They're, how they're influenced, right? Social yes. media and all those things. So I don't even know if I answered the question, but you, you, again, you got my, my brain going 1,000 miles an hour with uh, the impact. So I'm going to pass the baton to somebody else and hopefully Great. Can... Great. Well, uh, do you, one of you want to take it again? In your view, what are some of the key challenges and posed by digital transformation and untethering? So, um, can I go? Yeah, sure, man. If you're going in order. But, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, what, what it does is, is interesting. What it does is, in the networking side and data center, which we call disaggregation. If you were to translate what untethering means, it means disaggregation. Right. But it also means that you have these edges. I call this an edge. Mm -hmm. This is my edge data center for my house. Right. Technically, right. you could also call it a gateway. But forget the technical part. You know, the point is I can control my nest with that. I can control a couple of devices. I can switch on lights in my room. I'm a geek. Most people don't do that, I know. But still, <laughs> my point is I can do those things. Well, what this is doing is that you know, if uh, I came from an application development background, so I'm, I actually worked in app dev, then I worked into service provider, and I worked in CTO, CMO, that kind of a blending of different. So I'm a mutt that way. But, but what happens is this, that if you remember client-server development, you know, we look at the evolution of technology. We started with mainframes, centralized code, decentralized devices to touch it. 
Then you went to mid ranges, you get the deck alphas and that kind of equipment. Then you went to PCs. Well, what was the biggest problem with client server? Name one problem. The biggest problem with client server was distribution of code. So what did we do? We went and invented virtualization. I got a thousand desktops, I got a new version. How will I deploy it? I just put it on Citrix, it's okay. Everybody can go to the desktop virtualization and do it. The biggest problem with client server was massive, massive distribution of code. How do you deploy code? So then what happened? The HTTP protocol came along, it got more mature, we got to web applications. So the code started running on the application server. The code started to run on the application server. After that, what happened? Well, we had some, we, everybody wanted images and stuff. And there's a part of Hollywood that I'm suppo I'm, I think I'm told is the most creative in inventing these technologies. Um, in industry I will not name, but, but, but the point is that CDNs came into the mix. E-commerce came into the mix. So we ended up in a situation of this supply chain of data, if you will, where you had data being generated in many places, aggregated in some places, being stored in certain places, and, and again, analyzed in certain places. Those, those patterns are changing massively. So from us, from our industry standpoint, I think the points, the decision point that come to us is that we're, this, this untethering, what does it mean? What kind of disaggregation is gonna create? Where is the aggregation is gonna take place? Selfishly, from us as standpoint, where is my interconnection going to happen from Equinix? That's one, one of the things we do as a data center company. But it also comes down to that, what's the digital infrastructure? All of us together here as a supply chain have to make it work. Right. Because that millennial, that 18 year old wants it now, now. right now. <laughs> right. Wherever they are, whether in the bathroom or they're in the hallway or they are going to a concert. Right. People, they do their Amazon shopping online while driving in a car. Yeah, I, I need some paper, it'll come by tomorrow morning or something. <laughs> that was some of the challenges. Exactly, that's fantastic. It's just in a very interesting spot, my opinion. Yeah, I like that word disaggregation because that's really what's happening on a social level, on a technological yeah. level, data center right. level. So um, I think that's a real operative word today. Thank you so yeah. much. Do you want to take a stab at that? Yeah, um, so I, I, I actually, so I have uh, kids in the, in the teenager age and I know exactly what you're talking about. So, um, one of the things that it, it actually come up in, in our discussion with the Intel is, the, when you look at, we talk about all the automation, like autonomous car, Intel just uh, finished complete acquisition of uh, Mobileye, so $15 billion, we made a big bet. And you, as you handing over more and more to the machine, but there are also issues arise from it. Uh, for example, you, uh, we were setting up a um, autonomous driving garage in our headquarter in Santa Clara. Uh, we actually had to put in a, a computer vision to take in uh, information, images and videos from the road as far beyond. Because if you look at the autonomous driving, you're supposed yeah. to self-contain. In other words, with or without network, the car should be able to go. Because yeah, there are not many, everywhere you will have a network. But at the same time, imagine if you were driving down um, here in, in, in a tollway, you know I'm from, from North Dallas, I'm going down the tollway down to Fairmont. All of a sudden, your autonomous driving car start taking a exit going on 635 or whatever. The first thing coming to mind is that, oh my God, this thing's being hijacked. <laughs> I've been a, a hack. There's a whole lot of issues come in. So there is, you, you can't really turn everything over to the, mach to the machine. There need to be some amount of uh, feedback loop that need to come in. So we start building in this, uh, I, the, the computer vision through a different acquisition that we did in the past. What we did is taking different video streaming and through an edge video uh, reorchestration, broadcast that to all the cars. So as you were driving down, you could see there is a police action in, in through two exits in front. That's why autonomous driving cars started wheeling off and taking a different route. So you know you're not being hacked, you, but you, you put your mind at ease. That kind of social factor, I think it's, it, you need to be taking into consideration. I was going to the fully digitized world, which really brought us to, to, the, to the idea is that uh, the edge, whether we call it edge data center, edge compute, 
it actually is even more important in fulfilling this vision of fully automated world because fully automated does not mean a one track design process that you go, this is from here, I get there. You gotta take into account the, over the what ifs. All the what ifs has to be real time processed things that happen outside of your, your, your plan A, but need to be told to the human on the receiving end who no longer drives a car or even think about which route I'm taking. There's no more ways, but ways to tell you, hey, you know, uh, let me show you what's happening in front. That's why you're taking this route. That's just one example, but you could, we take the same consideration as we're going through this uh, proof of concept that we're undergoing with many of our customers, including industrial customers, uh, health. Health, everybody said, oh, e-health is such a part of gold, but think about all the complications of e-health. Yeah. That when you're under the knife, you're like, I need to know everything. It's not just handing over to the, to the, to the machine god. Right. So that's all this concern we're gonna build in. I think this is really interesting. And um, you know, it's, it, every one of these answers poses more questions. As she's saying that, you know, I totally get it, and I know you do too, this idea of it turning on over to the human. I thought about that cascading blackout situation because there was no human in the loop years ago. And uh, you know, one thing triggered the next, next thing, you know, half the country has no power. So this idea of turning it over to the human, but so then what if uh, it's kids in the car that you know, mom sent them off to school and they're seven years old, you know? Or, or maybe they're a young millennial, they don't even know how to drive a car. Do we need, uh, some uh, regulations in place that you have to learn how to drive a car even though it's autonomous. How does this work? I mean, this is all new, brave new world stuff. So for every uh, you know, instance that you're bringing up, you know, it, it, three more questions come up as a result. Thanks for that. Do you wanna take a, a crack at that, thinking about the idea of, uh, of the edge and, and untethering and what it might mean from your perspective? Sure, um, I'm overmatched on this panel. Uh, everybody here has obviously has uh, the technical chops to talk about this stuff. Don't I'm, talk, <clears throat> include Chris and I then. All right, I won't. Uh, I'm, we're a simple real estate company, and uh, so I work for Crown Castle. We have um, a very large uh, portfolio of shared infrastructure, and so we come at it from really, how, how do you make this world, which, which I'm a, a big proponent of, I think in, in you know, as we looked to, um, support the next nine billion people on the planet, we need to have these types of, of technologies to, and, and the ephemeral type of, of economy, like an Airbnb, so that we have a much more efficient use of resources. Um, so the question is, how, how do you make it all work? And I come at it from the, the lowest levels, right? So how do you get the latency there? And so we've, you have to have the latency and you have to have the ultra reliability of that latency in order for these things to work. Again, autonomous cars are only good if you can, if you can be assured of five, six, seven nines of, of uptime and that latency is always gonna be there. Mm -hmm. And so one of the challenges that we have is just in, in terms of the infrastructure, um, how do you, while, there, while there's a lot of fiber in the U.S. How do you how do you patch all that stuff together to make it work seamlessly, in order to kind of achieve those goals and um, and also the security around that? How do you how do you ensure that a lot of this autonomous, not the autonomous driving, the autonomous data center uh, operations are operating, um, you know, correctly? Um, so that's a lot of the work we're, we're doing is we're trying to ensure that there's standardization um, and inter interoperability to take place, um, you know, in this in this world. And so we deal a lot with um, municipalities, <clears throat> and when it comes to infrastructure, yeah, local infrastructure, it's all done locally, and there's so many different flavors of of. Uh, you know, how they want things to be deployed in the cities, but many of these applications that are gonna be mobile transcend municipalities, and autonomous cars, drones, and so forth are probably the, 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 the most prime examples. And the question is, is how do you get that fabric to be um, the same, yet, you know, uh, you know, locally different or acceptable throughout, you know, the U.S.? That's, that's like a, a quality that's a, standard yeah. issue across Absolutely. municipalities. And that's a that's a that's a big that's a big issue. Big if. Um, and so uh, that that's where I see the challenges coming in and trying to get this this uh, new world.
deployed. I think it's great. Let me segue onto a, a second question uh, for you because you're, you're all sort of hinting at these various issues and, and I think this is so, just so fascinating. So, you know, increasingly more and more critical systems, uh, again, are attached to, to networks. You know, again, you all are the beating heart of, of the circulatory system of information. When we talk about the expansion of the Internet of Things, uh, and also autonomous vehicles, which we're talking about, the, the quantified self comes to mind, this idea of digital health, which you just mentioned. Um, people are now you know, wearing devices and will continue, I think, amplifying this, uh, devices that might measure their, their heart rate or their blood pressure or, and give them feedback. In other words, hey, you need to get to the ER, you're having a heart attack or a stroke right now. I mean, I could, I could see that being a, a critical to, to people as we go. Um, so what's going to happen is people are going to build, and again, about the cars, maybe I don't know how to drive anymore. People become more and more dependent upon mm -hmm. these systems. There's a dependency that grows. People will trade a lot of, uh, of things for that kind of ease, convenience, and, and will create these dependencies on these systems. So uh, in this kind of climate where you have these de growing dependencies on what you all are doing, and that they're increasingly critical, and really cut to the core of, of important health, life and death issues which you're bringing up. What are your thoughts on uh, redundancies, resiliency uh, of your systems uh, in the context of edge computing and some of these issues that we're talking about? Do you wanna take it and head down that way? Uh, yeah, the, uh, George Slussman. Uh, yeah, I'd happy to talk about that. Actually, ironically, as you were speaking, talking through, uh, you know, when you were speaking to challenges, I was gonna you know, offer up that I think the most significant challenge we have in front of us, going from the problematic to the dystopian, which we, we can talk about computers eventually eating us all, which I think is a preordained outcome at this point in time. I'm definitely in the Elon Musk uh, corner with that. But you know, in the problematic side of it, yeah. near term is we are interconnecting and, and creating interconnected systems that are interdependent on each other. Um, I was fortunate enough to participate on National Security Council uh, panel on, on this topic, and, and the issue is we have no formalized methodology for being able to track and manage these interdependencies, interconnectedness of systems. Right. Um, things that you would not anticipate being dependent on each other or even interconnected can be, you know, incredibly interconnected and dependent on each other for for delivery of a service. And so whether it's when AWS has an outage and all of a sudden you can't swipe your credit card at the farmer's market, right? No one would have necessarily connected Amazon's data center to your ability to swipe your credit card at the farmer's market or even pay or receive payment, put someone out of business for the day. Um, and that could be anything from a network outage to a physical infrastructure outage to a purposeful act, right? There's, there's a, any number of events and we really don't have, we have not defined a methodology for measuring this and quantifying it and then being able to even assess it. Um, and it's a complicated problem because, you know, as you mentioned around jurisdictions and privity of information and who controls the system, who doesn't, how it's interconnected, it gets very complicated to aggregate this type of, of information. From a security perspective, we've had this very firewall approach to things for, um, you know, since the internet was invented, is that keep the bad guys out, which is a completely irrational and unattainable goal at this point in time. Yeah. Um, in any way, shape, or form. I mean, these devices are being carried in and out of firewalls every day, interconnected to systems, mm -hmm. applications, spying, you know, every ilk you can imagine that goes on on your phone, um, and gets connected to a network or touches a network or touches something you're trying to, uh, to, to contain. So you know, the long-term goal, in, in my view, is to get to a place where we can actually model a system or measure a system based on you know, control theory or some, some you know, classical mathematical study where you don't have to have an understanding of the underlying infrastructure, the underlying capability, but over time you can defer, decipher a st stable state and then unhook instabilities from the system when they become problematic, right? So just like your immune system doesn't endeavor to keep bacteria out of the system, it endeavors to identify it when it enters the system and then coordinate it off and destroy it individually. Similarly, as we interconnect all these systems and make them interdependent each other, what we have to do is be able to identify and reject those systems that aren't functioning properly or those pieces of the system that aren't functioning properly. And so the question about you know, where that goes to redundancy and resiliency is you're not solving any of these problems with multiple components or excess components, right? This is gonna have to be solved at the software tier. Um, we've endeavored to solve just like security with 
uh, firewalls we've endeavored to solve, resiliency with extra generators and extra UPSs and extra things and extra buildings and extra cables. And, and the reality is, is that the system is far too complex at this point in time to be able to identify which components of the system need to have resiliency based into it. Um, and so you know, my view and the thought is that as this challenge materializes, it's going to have to be solved higher up in the stack, really at the software layer or, or at the uh, you know, application framework layer to be able to cordon off and, and, and fix services that are not behaving properly, whether it's a car that's not steering the right way, uh, implant that's not just, uh, uh, putting enough insulin into your system, or you know, any of these different you know, dystopian, potentially, outcomes that, that we have in front of us. It's a, it's a monumentally complicated problem that we're running into. And furthermore, last point I'll make is, the people who should be responsible for helping solve this problem don't understand the problem. Yeah. So, uh, my dad, you know, described when my dad, my dad knew how to take a car apart and put it back together. I grew up knew how to use cars. I know how to put a computer together and connect it to the internet and make it print, right? My nephews know how to hit a button on a screen that connects to the internet and everything works. Unfortunately, generational change does matter. And with the tempo this is occurring, the gap between the folks who are in the role, to, in the position to make a decision around this and what the reality of what's going on on the street is so far disconnected that you know, we're, we're gonna struggle to find a way to solve this without a enormously devastating event occurring that's gonna trigger this, trigger ultimately some type of reconciliation. Yeah, I mean, we're, the, the Hiroshima of the internet's coming at some point in time. We have no understanding of what the, how these systems can be manipulated at the most fundamental level. I mean, how many people here know what code base runs on your chiller controller? Yeah. A handful, a <laughs> couple of people that care. Um, but the truth of the matter is if I can turn one chiller off in one data center or turn off one water valve to the fr your fresh water supply valve or turn off one pump, I can shut off an entire data center that can be filled with thousands if not hundreds of thousands of systems. Um, the infrastructure layer and the software layer are so far disconnected from a capability perspective today um, that we have a real risk that we've built into the system today. Yeah, I think this idea of these are complex systems getting more complex, uh, more interconnected, you know, bits, pieces, humans, behaviors. Uh, well, I mean, just to add on to that, I will point, a gentleman named Patrick Flynn, I saw some folks from Salesforce here run sustainably at, at uh, Salesforce, he gave a TED talk once about the biggest machine we've ever built is the internet because everything we build, we connect to the internet. Yeah. And so there's never gonna be a more complex or larger machine ever constructed in the history of the world as we know it today. We have never even contemplated dealing with something with this many nodal outcomes. On a combinatorial basis, it's an unsolvable problem. Yeah. I liked your idea of modeling. It makes me think um, you know, that we need uh, more sort of uh, visualization of data in different ways, uh, new ways of coming at this problem, but it is so complex. Uh, I think that, uh, and that's the other thing, I think it also spans um, disciplines. You didn't specifically say that, but you did in so many words. Uh, and, you know, that idea that, uh, you know, you're trying to model um, a, a complex system that's spanning so many different things and so many different disciplines that, you know, that also complexifies you know, who's talking to who and, and sort of creating. Well, for our industry, it's physical, yeah. too. Like, yeah. People forget the physicality Fiber, of the internet, physical, right? I mean, right. We, uh, this, in this room, how many millions of square feet of, and megawatts of power are yeah. you know, represented? Four manholes down the road from here, right, in a five-gallon tub of gasoline, and you can take the internet offline for Dallas. Um, you know, there's a physicality to this as well that no one quite understands, uh, you know, either or appreciates because again, it all runs in the cloud, but the cloud is billions of dollars of physical infrastructure that's being constructed. Exactly. Thank you. Um, do you want to take a shot at that, thinking about resiliency, redundancies, and and this sort of uh, in the context of edge computing and. and I mean, I agree. Complexity. I agree with George. I mean, that's that was going to be my comment was around the software resiliency aspects. I mean, at the end of the day. Um, you know, that's, that's how you're going to accomplish it. And the only other point I would make is, um, you know, from a, from a challenge standpoint, I think the edge should be a, uh, I guess, maybe a great thickener of things uh, for companies who are going to compete and be successful. And what I mean by that is companies who historically have had very siloed approaches to how they approach uh, their uh, accomplishing whatever vision, whatever transformation they're trying to do. Um, Right. You know, I think the edge, I see the edge forcing those, those uh, 
um, siloed functions uh, and owners together. I've seen it, I'm seeing it happen today, and I think it'll continue to happen, where, where people are forced to come together um, and you know, align on what is their, not just their infrastructure, their software, their security, um, and how are we going to approach this. It, 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 when it's compartmentalized and, and, and built things that are in a location, you know, that's how we've, we've gotten here to where we're at today, but going forward, I think it's gonna really drive different behaviors. I like the way you said that. I think on that idea of systems thinking, that's what we're trying to encourage over at USC amongst the engineers, yeah. is to think more systemically. Yeah, I mean, technology, I think this is a little cliche, right? Technology uh, is not the hard problem. It's the people, right? And, and technology is going to eliminate the people. So I, I think te yeah. technology is kind of like, I guess, well, like alcohol, right? Where it's, a, it's an amplifier of behaviors. <laughs> Um, you guys you know, are giving the best quotes. I hope yeah. you're getting all these, aren't they? I thought we were going to go to the bar and talk about the past. Well, we are, actually. Uh, anyways, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think everybody would agree that, that uh, you know, people, companies' abilities to align and communicate um, in this world going forward, what you described are, you know, that makes me not feel very positive about people's ability to come together and communicate. I mean, I don't know how many of you guys have been in, in meetings in your respective companies, and yeah. you're trying to make a decision. It should be a very simple decision, and there's 15 people with notebooks, and, and they're all open, they're all doing email because, um, you know, they have email that they've got to do, and they're less efficient, so they do more email in the meetings, they're not paying attention. Uh, decisions are being made that they're not aware of, and they go back, they have to have follow-up meetings, nobody's empowered to make decisions. You know, where is this going to go and how is this going to culminate going yes. forward in companies and organizations' abilities to take risk uh, and own their decisions and align on their visions? Right. Um, you know, the, the, the successful companies will, will figure out how to do that. I like that. I, these are the best quotes ever. Let me throw one more uh, question in the mix and then we'll turn to the audience um, for the last uh, two of you. And this is, this is a real challenge and you guys can jump in as well. As we talk about uh, the future and getting into the internet of them scenario, uh, you know, we've got increasing automation uh, coming up, we've got artificial intelligence, and this sort of creates an end of jobs program, uh, problem. We're you know, hinting at that, um, this idea that uh, people are made um, redundant to, the, to work, uh, and work brings people uh, a sense of meaning and purpose, uh, providing for their families and all these kinds of things. Um, I'm thinking about the torches and pitchforks problem, you know, which will impact big companies if, if uh, suddenly I was telling one of the fellows here that uh, um, guy I know called up his Midwestern relatives that are truckers, and they're going to automate trucks eventually, you know, these long distance, long haul truckers. You know, those guys are proud, they have a great job, they provide for their families, and, and so he just kind of ran it by him and said, uh, well, what are you going to do when uh, they automate the trucks and, and you can't drive anymore? And the guy said to him, well, they're going to have a problem driving those trucks when we shoot the tires out, and we own all the guns, and we know how to use them. And I thought, there we go. You know, so that, that sort of uh, backlash, let's say, toward this marching, relentless marching toward automation, relentless marching towards AI, um, it, which is displacing workers. Uh, what can we do to train a future workforce uh, to uh, adapt to this changing scenario, or is there anything we can do? Um, people have suggested that we're going to have to pay people off with a universal basic income. You know, do we go that route? And if so, what happens to all these people with nothing to do? Idle hands at the devil's workshop, they say. So uh, on the last two, you know, what are you thinking about the future in terms of workforce development, in terms of you know, what's needed, or is anyone needed, or will it just be these empty giant data centers with no one uh, in them? Well, not to give you a challenging yeah, question, but it's a great question. Now, let me let me start with just sort of um, amplifying your introduction. And I'll, I'm going to spin it over because um, you know none of these data centers or this foundation engineering or infrastructure would exist if the applications didn't exist, and none of that would exist if there wasn't a desire by individuals uh, to be more than what they currently are capable of doing. So. I would say what the driver of the edge and all of these technologies that we're involved in is people's insatiable desire to be the omnis, right? Omnipresent, om om omniscient, you know, and all those different things. Just the ability to do anything when they want, to be anywhere where they want to be at the moment that they want to be there, and to t gain access to any of these things. And so I think the future 
has everything to do with how we augment our biological state. Um, and then what drives that is this industrialized internet requirement in order to enable that to be predictable and to have security around it and it's for it to be foundational in order for these type of things to occur. So you kind of already know this. Um, I know this with my own kids. There's not a question you can't ask your kids, <laughs> those that have a cell phone. But they won't Google it real fast and tell you the answer, even if it's right or wrong, but right. they'll, they'll, they'll answer it that way. And so we already see sort of this behavior and this transition in our society where no one is really stuck looking at the dictionary anymore or trying to, trying to figure out you know, what the context of the conversation is about. They can quickly go Google and try to position themselves to understand and be a, a part of that. Right. So having that as a driver in the background, uh, I guess the answer is that society will pivot with the technologies that it enables to be useful for themselves. And you can see this in history, right? I mean, in the industrial age, when there was a pivot from, from the trades and the specific types of um, guilds that were making particular products, when they industrialized that and moved it into me mechanization and that transition, um, new jobs opened up, new types of careers, new types of work. Um, I don't think it'll be any different as we industrialize the internet and as we move beyond into augmented and realities and, and also into artificial intelligence. I think there will be different roles and different shepherds of different technologies that are required in order to, to do that. My, I tease my dad, my dad's an electrician, but I always tease him, you know, he had the blue collar job of the 70s, I have the blue collar job of the, of the 2000s, right? That's so it's amazing. really most of the technology industry has become the blue collar role. And I would just say that um, the, the real challenge for us in our particular industry is that we're an aged industry. I'm like one of the young guys in this industry, actually. So we're an aged industry, and so as a result of that, um, we're not seeing folks who appreciate the foundation and the infrastructure levels of what's involved to deliver this in an industrialized way. Right. So I think um, that's our real challenge, is finding those who want to step in to, to manage the physical and the connective ubiquity that we need to have in order to enable it. Right. I like the way you talked about the guilds and the transition to jobs. You know, there is a trend coming up. And, you know, you think about as things become more automated, more digital, um, sort of high tech, that there's, you know, there's always a, a counter movement or a backlash or, you know, a counter force to, to trends that happen. And there's a bit of a trend happening now around the handmade, the craft, the craft cocktail, the hand stitched leather thing, the quality. So there's almost like that feeling for that high touch. Um, and, and craftsmen and barbers and you know all these kinds of things happening now. So um, you know perhaps that will be where um, the the uh, value shift comes in towards high touch, towards you know these things that are exclusively one offs or uh, human made and things like that. So thanks for that great uh, great answer. Do you have any more thoughts on this idea of the end of jobs problem and can we create a new workforce coming up or are we just uh, paying everyone off to? Uh, Sure. So first, thank you for letting me burn 3,000 calories as an ADD guy waiting for it to be able to talk. <laughs> <laughs> Holy smokes, that was hard. Um, <laughs> you got to sit closer to me next time. Yeah, I'm, I'm fighting the same problem now still. I may, if, I, if I twitch, just don't worry about it, okay? So, um, you know, what, what's interesting, you, you talk about the end of jobs being the apocalypse. I don't see that being the issue. Uh, I mean, I, I think it's a it's a mu much more of an existential issue than that in terms of um, the whole concept that I get a couple of teenagers we talk about all the time. If you, if you willfully give away your civil liberties and you don't study how history, how history has used collectivism and, and the state, I mean, for all the horrors the Nazis did, it pales in comparison to Mao and Stalin. And if you take a state-based view, if you take the tyranny of the simple majority throughout human history, and, and that's the real negative power that this collective has, or this collective mentality has. Because if you don't, if you look, I mean, from a uh, Pareto's principle, right? I mean, we see it on exhibit constantly. That's the concept that, you know, a couple peas in the garden actually produce the bulk of the, of the, of the crop. Um, not everything produces equally, and, that, and we continue to see that, um, the 80-20 rule, if you will. Uh, if you look at the great tech companies, they're all individuals that were 
dominant personalities that created these things. Right. Um, and, and so I think technology is interesting because, you know, I was a computer science back in the, in the early 90s. We didn't study ethics then and you don't study it today. And the fundamental issue is, is you have an entire generation in which they haven't studied history, they don't understand civics, and they don't understand ethics. Last time that we went through generations of people taking, uh, doing university education in which they went out after the, high, the best degrees, which in our case is technology today, post the baby boomers generation, that was going to get an MBA. And they went to the Harvards and the Yales, and that became the corporate raiders of the 1980s because there was no ethos. There was no system for these people. They were not educated properly. I think that's the biggest risk that we have as a society, is that people don't think as a computer scientist whether or not the data that they're storing should actually be compartmentalized, whether or not it should actually be stored, whether or not it should be there or not. Uh, they don't think about connecting up a network and whether or not it should be connected or it shouldn't be connected. There's no thought process, there's no training in our university systems along those lines, and it's a massive gap that we have. And it's gonna create an apocalypse that I don't frankly hope that I live to survive because it's a, it's a real negative one. So there you go. I love that. That's a, this is depressing, huh? Yeah. Sending us yeah, all the happy know, hour right yeah. now. Just to yeah. add on to that point, so I think it's interesting. So I was reading, there's an okay. interesting dialogue about the new iPhone X and the facial recognition. Yes, yes. Insurance companies are already planning to use that to underwrite life insurance because they're going to correlate your facial, what your face looks like, to your weight, your age, your sex. Yes. What drugs you use. What, how often you consume alcohol. Challenge. Right, because Challenges again. Challenges is all it takes is one bad person. Right, that's what I'm saying. So the point of it is the simple thing you think so convenient to unlock your phone is actually going to be used as a core element to underwrite your risk as an insured health insurance, life insurance, whether or not. I mean, all of these things we don't think about as we give away the, all of that information. The right, database and DNA. Yeah. 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 I know. You don't even need that. You have... Uh, Alessa, listening to everything you say. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's why I don't turn on my on Echo the, Dot. <laughs> on the positive side, back to Eddie's point, though, I mean, the, the whole point around infrastructure resiliency and things like that, it's about truck rolls, to use a concept that the utility industry uses. This is just about, I'll go deal with it when I have to deal with it. And, and so it's very similar to how data is deleted on the cloud. It's deleted, and you chase it around for a while, and you know, 40% plus of the data that's out there in the cloud is already deleted. We just have replicated it so many times yeah. we can't quite deleted. find it. Deleted, right, so, right. Um, so I, I think it just boils down to utility. It's, the, it's a different version of industrialization is why resiliency is important. It's not about mm -hmm. whether or not you can do it at the software layer. Of course you can do it at the software layer, although I, I'll just say it's still a little bit of a unicorn. Um, in, I would agree with that. Oh, yeah. No, it is. Um, but you're doing it so that you don't have to deal with it. And you're doing it so that the people can physically deal with things when they can deal with things. Exactly. Well, I see our fearless leader has taken the podium. <laughs> well, I, I've only taken it because I do want to take an online question. And I, I did notice as we went down the table, we got more and more depressing. <laughs> hey, we're <laughs> arms dealers, okay? We, Glad how I saw they use side. it is not my fault. Weaponized so. media, yes. So this question from the online audience from streaming, uh, now let's see if Maybe I can get it back it. again, gets us back to the edge. <laughs> I think we just fell off it. Um, and this person asked the question, is the edge the home for HPC? Is this where supercomputing is going to reside primarily in the future? Juan, do you want to so, take that? He's, he's now quivering over here to answer the question. <laughs> Juan, you got it. So, I, so the use cases I have seen of HPC when I used to run a cloud program before and with what I see for our customers in our data centers is that that tends to be a very core phenomena, as in, um, you know, a lot of number crunching, a lot of things that, are, that need math, mathematical and floating point expressions done by more than sophisticated CPUs. And my, my bias towards thinking is that those are best done in a data center. Going with the previous theme of segregation of data, I do believe that everything we talked about, social media, clicks, 
segregation and the untethering, if a social media company is giving you clicks, they're not doing it for free. There is an ad and a revenue stream coming out of it. Mm -hmm. That is being monetized. Never forget that. There's an economic model behind that. So just like I keep something very, seek, very safe to me, there's a bank, there's a locker. Your hotel room has a locker. You can put your valuables in it if you go to the pool. Just like that, segregation of data and, and operations will take place in different places. My bias towards thinking is that edge will be a lot of aggregation points, but a lot of serious valuable stuff, which is sacred to your business model, does belong in the data center. So I can follow up for just a second to go back to something that Tom Humphrey said this morning related to retail in this case. As we begin to use machine-to-machine, uh, -machine, machine learning, AI at the edge, right, in order to be able to do the kinds of analytics that are required so that when the person walks through the door, you know what they last bought and where they last bought it and what their waist size is, and thank you very much, I'm not telling you. Um, <laughs> you know, is, that a, is that an HPC level compute requirement at that point, or is it simply GPU oriented what's it? it it could be hpc but i guess the biggest definition there is that what is the edge the, the edge could be a data center which is yeah. which is multiple megawatt edge does not mean a kilowatt or a watt data center edge i mean edge can edge processing can happen at many tiers so when you look at that what i look at it is a data supply chain starting to end and where there, there's, I mean, it's, I'm not, it's hard to wrap it up with a single answer, but it really means what processing you're doing. Machine-to-machine -machine communication, again, to me, that looks like the first level of data transfer. The anal anal analysis of it is more on the, the GPUs would probably be in a slightly bigger data center profile. The cruncher is this, when you add machine learning, well, I was at an innovation conference last week near Bastrop in Austin, where I live, and the number of use cases that are using machine learning and AI are staggering now. It's becoming very much commodity. It's not replacing job because you need people to crunch those machine learning and do, do magic with it. But that machine learning is also getting distributed. Some of that is happening on the edge. So to your point, Bruce, a lot will happen in the data center, but it'll have to be federated, or the data sets have to be synchronized between the cloud and the, and, the, and the core data center and the edge data center, and these three have to be intelligently in sync with each other. They cannot exist as islands of information. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just here. dying to say something about this. So, <laughs> I mean, these are patterns Thank that you. have been re replicated already. Um, what's happening is, has already happened before, is the best way to say that. So if you look at the way the telecommunications network works, or if you look at the way that our power distribution network works, right. the edge would be potentially the last, um, the last segment or the last node that's regulated. And I think that that really is what's going to define the edge for us in the next 10 years. And what, what becomes regulated in uh, distribution? If you look at the data centers today, um, just to the point, I mean, there was a show on called Mr. Robot, if y'all watched that. It shows this great sort of anarchical impact on data centers um, through the air conditioning system. It may have been a Siemens system. I'm just kidding. But anyways, uh, <laughs> so I'm just, just think about that per perspective for a moment, and you can understand sort of how disruptive that can become in this, in, in this world. But at the same time, um, so I, I think data centers will become regulated because of the impact on GDP over time, whether it's by natural disaster or by or or by uh, attacks. But I think um, what happens, though, is that people forget that when we talk about data sets, data sets by themselves in unique ways are not nearly as interesting and are far less dependable for our decisions than those that are in aggregate. And so when you aggregate these data, data sets and you look at the aggregation of that entire um, you know, flora of different inputs, then you make better decisions based upon the data, the data strands. The only place you can do that is in aggregation locations for that. So I think you know, just like you know, harmonic centralization sort of aggregates across the network and provides best path, I think you'll have the same thing apply itself to data sets as well. Bruce, can I just make a quick point? I, I, I realize that everybody, I agree. 
the one thing I want to add is that um, we, when we think of data center, you know, you, you, you think of a lot of powers, a lot of compute. Don't forget that at the edge, that's also where all the communication pipes becomes most challenging. The last half a mile, the last 200 meter is often the hardest to reach. Uh, you think about the, you know, if you live in the more rural areas here in Dallas, that's yeah. even in Hong Kong where I grew up, you think, oh, you, everybody got everything. No, the last thing that from the wall to my, to the to the living room, it's the hardest thing to penetrate. That's why you see one of the reasons why 5G so stands out as a potential to solve that is because. Finally, people crack the problem of millimeter wave. The higher you go, there's an inverse relationship. The higher you go, the bigger the pipe is. Now you can finally be a fiber replacement through an airway for a short distance. Yeah. Now, that's when all that uh, uh, the HPC on the edge, I'm kidding, but it's like it's the, some amount of analytics and start a, you can turn that in the edge because now you can collect the information where you previously will have trouble getting through. Again, remember Shannon's law. You know, so that is the real breakthrough technology-wise that complement the data center on the edge reality. Otherwise, you will be way too expensive. Uh, and Alan, it, it, it occurred to me, and I, I think it's something we communicated about a long time ago, 5G is like the gasoline on a burning house, right? That th this is what's going to ignite that last mile. It's not even so much about the long haul. Yeah. It's the I would last, agree. Yeah. I would agree. And, <clears throat> excuse me. From, from a carrier's perspective, <clears throat> something's got to be re-architected in their networks as well. And I think if you, can, if you can push out to the edge and have the edge with the fiber, with the millimeter wave, now all of a sudden you can have a disaggregated, you know, Nokia came out with their any haul, mm -hmm. right? So it doesn't have to come back. So it's a much more flexible fabric uh, which I think will lower the cost, but that's exactly right. You know, once once 5G comes along and, and allows for multiple uh, multiple ways to get that last mile fiber, um, wireless uh, that that are all high bandwidth and low latency, it, it creates a, a much much more interesting fabric around around the edge. You're talking about a, a, the greatest denial of service attack ever. I mean, at, at the, <laughs> it, does, it won't work in terms of what people's vision is of what 5G is and where the network is in an industry that's done our greatest telecom investment that we've done in the past 20 years since the PE firms have quit investing in it post Telecom De Deregulation Act has been to introduce submarine cables terrestrially. Right. That's not a big innovation. So we've got a long way to go on the network side. It, it will break. Um, spectacularly as well in terms of, uh, and, and it's great because what things like what Crown's doing is al allowing people to avoid the congested pathways. And, and so as the network eventually turns meshier um, to, to, to look at different pathways, I mean, we see it today in India, you know, where you have, I think it's a one fiber cut per 100 miles per month, right? So that means for a short distance, I have to have like nine paths you know, and if you're a big provider and you're doing 10 terabits or 20 terabits or whatever the number is. So you start thinking about those types of bandwidths and what goes on. 5G just dwarfs a lot of that stuff if you're really using it at that. Luckily, there, we don't have the application cases yet, but it's not a leaky bucket, it's a bucket without a hole. I mean, it's no bottom on it. One, one last comment about the HPC and the edges. I, I, I hope everyone's ordered their new Xbox One X because I'm on the list and hopefully get soon. Uh, if I read the specs correctly, it's 14 and a half teraflops of processing. You know, 20 years ago, that was a national security regulated device that would be illegal for anyone to own. So supercomputers are at the edge, <laughs> and they're in your home today, and they're going to be used, you know, serially for all sorts of things. Nvidia. I can't believe you use it for SimCity, though. <laughs> yeah, I uh, know. Astro. <laughs> get the old game co or the old uh, Atari Super Pack with every game Atari ever made. Uh, no, but the other ones, you know, look at NVIDIA stock, right? It's because, you know, GPUs are going to be in everything, right? So that's, those are micro supercomputers that are going to be sitting everywhere. So um, it's happening before our eyes. Interesting. So we do need to turn this uh, out to you folks. Uh, this is your roundtable. Uh, please come to the mics. There's one on either side. Uh, 
uh, contribute to this conversation, ask questions, throw food. Please. Sure, please. <laughs> Any burning questions about the future? The sugary snacks. Maybe perfect. somebody can come up with something optimistic to bring the, bring yeah, right. the mood up burning, a little bit. The burning I'm questions. just scared. Facebook's going to cure the cancer. Mango. George, I'm scared. <laughs> oh, Ross Johnson with Schneider Electric. You guys talked a little bit about security. We've talked about the edge. Is the edge inherently safer just simply because it is not so aggregated? George, you mentioned five manholes in downtown Dallas taking out all the internet. That scares me. It's kind of similar to Mr. Robot uh, that you were yeah. talking about. He took right. out five data centers from Stone Mountain. That's right. how he took it down. He took it down through a, uh, I think it was an HVAC contractor. And I don't know if it was Siemens or Schneider, whoever it was, but he <laughs> took it down nonetheless. So my question is, is it just inherently safer now that we're starting to kind of go back out to the edge that we're all talking about so, so often? Just another access point. Yeah. I think I it there's physical security and then there's interoperability. And those are kind of the two things I'm trying to kind of weigh. I think some would say that it's, it's uh, infinitely more opportunities for more, more failures and more, more danger. Others would say that it's, uh, it's an opportunity to drive the necessary change that we need to have a more secure edge. It's becoming definitely much more, I think it was said in the earlier uh, roundtable, it's becoming much more of a topic of concern and it's getting tons and tons of press and, you know, R&D and people are focusing on cybersecurity, but I don't know if it will ever keep up with the fact that you're going to add billions and billions more data points of places to get onto the network to create more gaps. So it's going to be this, you know, cat chasing its tail constantly, um, but at least it's bringing the issue to the forefront. and. If there ever is some sort of a standard, somebody will break that standard the day after it's made. So it's always going to be this continuous evolution. But I think more people are aware of it. Um, and we're probably a little bit more prepared for the cybersecurity threat. I mean, you think about back in the day, my parents never wanted to get a debit card because they were afraid somebody was going to steal all their money. And then as, as hacking, right, <laughs> as, as it happened, and then banks all put in that, like, you're not responsible for more than 50 bucks, then, OK, now it's not an issue anymore. So, the evolutions kind of take, it's, it's, the, it's the practical stuff along with the cyber piece, and those two kind of go hand in hand. They evolve to a solution that we're all acceptable of, or accepting of, I guess. So security is really about data loss. It's really what it comes down to. So I actually am more afraid of you know, natural disasters than I am of hackers for the most part, because uh, you know, an incredible amount of data can be lost all at once. But, you know, we just had a couple of hurricanes that hit the U.S., and there's not a really a big story, at least I haven't seen one yet, about massive data loss in the Houston area. Um, so I guess my answer to that is that I think, um, at least as an enterprise and an Internet-based company customer, I would say that, you know, we've taken the steps to prevent data loss. Um, how we lose that data, I think, is important, and obviously PII or personal information becomes you know critical to the business but I think at the end of the day most of the companies have been protecting themselves against data loss in a massive way and um, and it is for things like you know natural disasters you know it used to I was just worried about whether we made our backups and got our tapes out but you know now that's not even a, a consideration anymore because we have it the copies distributed so quickly and so diversely it's really not not the issue anymore from that perspective. It also comes down to securing the pieces of data, the data supply chain in different places. So, you know, there is a supply chain of different types of data centers when you look at it, and there's different networks. So, um, it, it, you know, you, would you, resiliency at the edge, if you are you saying if I just go away, well, I won't have much there. It would still, disrupt the supply chain, but think of it this way, that if an internet node goes down today in a city because of a reason, the internet doesn't go down, it just finds a route from a different path. So resiliency from will be there just because it's distributed, but there will be always best practices about what data to keep where. Where do you keep the crown jewels of your company? I think the edge or in a core data center? You're going to have a lot of, I mean, it, it's going to flip. Instead of it being always connected, I think it flips to just being, do I need to connect it? You know, a lot of 192 networks that, that can be out there. And then what data actually needs to be real time? I think we as programmers think everything's real time, and yet very, very little data really needs to be real time. And so that, that, that's eventually, I think, where a lot of the security elements can come in uh, into play, where it's more batch and, and 
batch and send versus it being, oh, I'll go get it, I'll go retrieve it. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, the lower networks, the low-power new networks for IoT, some of them are meant to support sensors that don't even have a TCP IP stack. Yeah. They're not always on, and a low battery life. So, yeah, right on. So just to, because resiliency is a topic of tomorrow's uh, keynote roundtable, um, from the standpoint of the edge, is the edge inherently going to be assist resiliency, or is it a risk? Is it resiliency? Positive or negative? Resiliency is based on end user experience. So whoever's paying to use the app, whoever's paying for that service, really that's where resiliency needs to, to land. So you, you determine your redundant models or your run to fail models or your resiliency models based upon what you're delivering and the end user experience ultimately. So whether that's at a regulated edge facility or whether that edge is in your car or whether that edge is at you know, a centralized hub in your home or whatever, whatever that ultimately becomes for that type of service, the resiliency has to occur, you know, basically at the end user's experience. So but it may be multi the market, the market multi carrier, will, it may be multi pathing. The application usage model in the market will drive how much it costs based on you know, whatever that value is provided and and so you'll have you'll have not infinite, but you'll have a, you know a tremendous amount of variation in whatever that resiliency is based so on. So there's a difference model. in in value between Facebook and a wearable heart monitor. Absolutely. The resiliency is just the inverse of value or cost, right? Or, you know, again, if you're running a trading platform, that trading platform going offline costs you, the corporation, X amount of, you know, millions of dollars per day, so you're more than willing to pay to, but if my heart rate monitor quits working, I throw it in the drawer and. Ideally, it drives, it, it drives positive behavior. If, if I can, you know, if I have a, 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 a Maybe a private edge terminology, um, and I develop a software layer of resiliency that allows me to minimize the amount of physical resilience or hardware resiliency I have. That I can I can recognize more value for that resiliency. If it doesn't, then I won't do it. Yeah. Bruce, and I think a case it, by case basis. I think it depends as we talk about where in the edge you are, right? If you're in that last 200 yards and there's no other network redundancy, that that's your edge. So your resiliency is based on. I don't care how much software redundancy you have, if the hardware devices aren't up at that end of the edge, right, you're down. So it depends on the user experience, what you, like 911, right? Like when, when we went to VOIP phones, right, through cable providers, that last half mile had to have eight hours of battery protection in order for you to provide 911 service. So same thing, the level of service will be dependent on the application, but it's also gonna be where in that of course, architecture yeah. you are. The whole 911 network was brought down from a glitch on the iPhone, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's where, if you- Can we go back? to the part where you said you had a heart. <laughs> <laughs> yes, hi Rich. I don't even know how to respond. In the previous panel, we had uh, a bunch of references to the future that we weren't talking about. So I wanted to, to kind of go back to uh, a, a couple of those. And one is just about what this circulatory system is going to look like and how quickly uh, it develops and, and how the industry is prepared right now to deliver on that possibility. So here we have people with sort of different approaches. Chris builds brick and mortar uh, data centers with a sensibility for the edge. Ty and George have a lot of experience with modular form factors. Uh, how are the, uh, the sort of form factors that we uh, are, have right now aligning with the economics uh, for how we right size and, and build for the edge and, and is that ready to go now or is there still design innovation to come to be able to you know, keep up with the, the, the kind of crazy future that, that Julie's outlined? I'll, I'll start. I, you know, I think, I think uh, they're, they're both ready. I think um, the, I mean, but there's a lot of work to be done and as, as the uh, the future takes us whatever direction this is going to take us. You know, looking for how how can I have the most flexibility? How can I have the fastest time to market? How all these tenants that we talked about that are important for for whatever that future is? I don't I, I don't 
can't paint that picture exactly what this is going to look like five years from now, but having the ability to, um, to right size and optimize whatever it is, um, you know, I think that will drive. And, and I don't see any differentiation. I think whether it's, whether it's uh, repurposed, whether it's modular, modular as a system, whether it's modular as a uh, methodology for building a larger facility, um, I think all of those apply. I think they all have a usage model that can be applied. I think part of it is the uh, getting the critical mass of customers to come and deploy and co-locate in order to uh, support the business model. Right? It's not it's not cheap to to deploy out at the edge and a little bit of a chicken and egg game that we're kind of grinding our way through. There's a very physical aspect to this too, in that um, nobody wants in their neighborhood a bunch of shipping containers. <laughs> so you know you've got to put it. But your brick and mortar buildings are so beautiful. No. <laughs> the, the <laughs> With all the generators out the back and the is, chiller flats. The point is, is you're either put you're either putting it inside of a box right, that you got to that you got to skin, and HJs are getting more and more. Di sorry, uh, local authorities are getting more and more difficult. Um, that regulation is coming more and more into play. And so, you know, it's, it, as we start to design things that work within the fabric, much like utility companies did, much like telecom companies did, um, you know, from a tower perspective, right, you've got to make it look like a Christmas tree sometimes or uh, whatever that thing is. <laughs> the pineapple. Um, you know, yeah, the, yeah. Those, you know, it's, it's yeah, difficult it because people want the technology, but they also want it to work within that, you know, what was the uh, ephemeral uh, Brooklyn bedroom that you showed up on the picture. Yeah, make it fit. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Rich, my, my take, at, and we've talked about this going on for a decade probably, but you know, the data center is going to ha has to and has continued to reduce the componentry inside of it, right, to be able to deliver on the economic value that it can deliver to the end user, whether it's end user experience, resiliency, reliability, capability, et cetera. Um, you know, IO and our sister company, Basler, and we've been delivering edge locations, outdoor modular systems. You know, we have, our oldest one in production has been out there for five years now. So, you know, this is not a rel this is new in the context of the user base, but in the context of implementing these technologies, whether, you know, the public loose goes ones is, you know, like Johns Hopkins University for their high performance computing center. It's all outdoors. It's right on their campus. It's in the, you know, right next to the, you know, their, uh, their administration buildings, et cetera, um, to going to locations that don't have those regulatory requirements because they're already exempt, like utility substation sites, like we've done with Salt River Project and deployed data center capacity right at a utility substation, um, which again accomplishes a couple goals at the same time. There's highly resilient points inside of the electrical grid today, right? The further you get into transmission or closer to transmission, the closer to generation you get, these are five, nine, six, nine systems that have been operating for decades on decades on decades. Um, and so by co-locating the data center next to resilient infrastructure, network and power, instead of bringing network and power to the data center, you're able to then reduce componentry of the data center, right? Reduce, remove generators completely from the system, remove battery energy storage from the system, right? These are the expensive components of the data center. Um, and, you know, at least in my perspective, we're going to have to move the data center to a place ultimately with the ubiquity of its use to where it's sub $2 million a megawatt to deploy. Um, which means there's no efficient supply chain so solving that. That's reducing and replacing and removing components from the system. So, um, and that, you know, again, through software, uh, whether it's software or through operational redundancy or system redundancy, uh, meaning at the application virtual machine hypervisor container orchestration layer, um, you know, the, the data, the innovation data center is going to have to continue to improve to, to meet the ubiquity of it. And I agree with the, you know, the local jurisdiction issue and NIMBY, and we're already seeing the not in my backyard problem everywhere. I mean, drive through Virginia, right? You know, there's, I think there's, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. It's just like your towers. I mean, yeah. you drive around the street, how many towers do you spot? I mean, if you pay attention, there's <laughs> thousands of them in the metros and you yep. know, no one wants them, but everyone wants great phone service or cellular service or mobile service or data service as we go and move on. That's the, uh, the, the, you know, the one, I don't want to call it a Trojan horse, but the, 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 the one thing that we see on the rise that, that may help with that jurisdiction problem is the, the whole concept of smart communities. And if, uh, you know, we're, we're out there trying to educate them that 
edge data centers, as well as you know, towers, small cell attachments, and fibers actually provides the infrastructure for a lot of what they're trying to do on the smart, smart communities front, um, providing these you know, high value services to their, to their constituencies, as well as reducing the overall cost of running a city. And so uh, there seems to be some, uh, th there seems to be some positive signs in terms of acceptance from, from that, but it's, it's still, it's the local jurisdictions, that, that's, a, that's a big issue. Well, the, the challenge with distributed environments, particularly edge data centers, is that it actually costs more in the end because there's more of them, right? And so you have these dependencies that are associated with them for serviceability, from infrastructure perspective, for connectivity, for ubiquity. You just ask any of the carriers today why they're shedding their local line, it's because it's so expensive to operate, right? So at the end of the day, the more you have, the more it's going to cost you. The idea is how do you share that cost? Where do you share that cost? Do you share it with your community? Do you share that with the providers? Do you share that with the, with the consumer? I think it's one of the challenges, that, one of the bigger challenges besides legal challenges about edge computing and about, well, I don't want to say that word, not edge computing, edge anything. Um, one of the challenges that you're going to find is that um, someone has to foot the bill in this transition to, you know, uh, you know, telekinesis or whatever it is that we're going to move to. Um, I would say right now that you have a pretty powerful edge device that you carry with you everywhere, which is your cell phone, and you can use that as body network for connectivity of a lot of things. Um, in fact, I think like uh, we had we had some carrier outage just recently, and all my kids turned on all their, their you know tethering, and they were still playing Xbox across their tethered cell phones, which I had to pay for. So, I mean, at the end of the day, we have these ways of building this sort of edge resiliency already. And I guess the question really is, is why do we have to, other than the regulated com conversation I had, aside from that, why do we have to define that in a particular genre or a particular way? Why can't it just be the technology that needs to aggregate the last mile? And that, that technology can be a device or it can be you know, it can be a bee box that's out in the field, or it could be a slick, or it could be, you know, an MDC or, or an edge, you know, brick and mortar facility. It could be a lot of different things. But I, I would suggest that, you know, I would suggest that our dependency on these things are going to continue to grow. And so it's probably going to be something um, that will be just as innocuous as, say, transformers or you know, street light control systems or, or things like that. I don't think it'll be, I don't think you're gonna have, you know, 50 CO style buildings inside of a, a city trying to deliver connectivity that way. See, see the, the thing is that scale gives, reduces cost. If you look at what the hyperscalers are doing with the really massive data center build outs we've never seen in history, one of the reasons is they can drive down cost by a massive scale, it's very big. So when you look, start looking at why do you need an edge data center, if you were to ask that question, why do you need an edge data center? Are you solving for latency or are you solving for something else? Undoubtedly, if you can't have shared infrastructure with heating, cooling, uh, I mean cooling in most cases, unless you're in cooling, as well as power, as well as network, then you're just creating cost there. For what reason? I'll give an example. I live in Austin and what if I were to open my door and uh, the data center that contains the logic for my, my smart card is in Dallas. What's the latency, latency radius between Austin and Dallas? Do you think it's, take a guess, one millisecond, half a millisecond between Austin and Dallas, with good fiber? So the point is that it is, um, it's a little bit, I mean, what, you, what, what, are, what are we solving for? You know, there is the other visceral desire to have a control system that you can just reboot the thing when it goes down. What I'm talking about is pre-IoT stuff. You know, there's a machine controller and the machine's not behaving. I just reboot the thing, the memory will shake out and the thing will be okay. There is that desire to kick the thing in the guts and reboot it. Well, you can still do that, but that's the end, that's not the edge. Now, is that the last mile? When you look at IoT and you look at analog systems which will become IoT systems. I'm talking about pumps, impellers, turbines. These things which are completely manual driven, you have to go and thunk a knob. That now you do through a smartphone. Those, those are the question that where do you deploy that logic? I, w I do want to probe a little bit though on the concept that scale just solves everything. No, it doesn't solve anything. We've, we've scaled it. 
I mean, yeah, I, mean I don't know if you've seen it, but you've got we built 350 megawatts a day center, and you get to a certain point, you can't get any more efficient, right? I mean, you get to a point. I mean, labor's labor's linear. And Correct. The materials have have limitations. Steel, copper, switchboards don't sit on a shelf somewhere. Um, they get made. Um, you know, if you look at what's happened with you know what Amazon, Google, uh, Hurricane you know, name the last three hurricanes and what that's going to do to the supply chain of things. Scale doesn't help that problem. Scale actually hurts that problem even more so than a distributed type of approach. So it's a it's an economic theory that is usually correct, but not always correct. I mean, so you, you do have distribution can solve some things a little bit more efficiently in some respects. I think to Eddie's point, though, the, the ultimate determinant is going to be capital. Because capital always finds its most efficient path. Well, I agree with that. And also, it's largely a commodity-driven industry, meaning the core components that go into what we build are commodities, steel, copper, right? If I go into the gold market and buy billions of dollars of gold, the price goes up. Right? It doesn't go down because I'm buying more. So similarly, I mean, labor, right? These things are, this is again, the physicality of the data center. People lose sight of it until they go to these industrial sites. And I'm not saying that you're not wrong. I mean, the data center's gotten wildly more efficient to build than it was, you know, I wish my friend Peter Gross was here. I don't, mm -hmm. he made the, back, back when EYP was building data centers, they were, you know, uh, making, doing very well, you know, building these these data centers. Um, you know, at 15, 20 million dollars a no megawatt. Peter, Peter. Yeah, no, no picking yeah, up. Peter always not here, that's unfair. Um, no, but the point of it is, you you know, 15, 20, 25 million dollars a megawatt was not an uncommon number to hear in a large scale enterprise data center for the financial services sector in 19, late 80s, early 90, mid 90s. Today, everyone is basically in the same ballpark depending on the specification. You know, somewhere between seven and 10 million dollars a megawatt depending on the locality, depending on what labor costs are. And you might be a little bit lower than that, a little bit higher than that. Um, but the reality is capital is, you know, the data center business is actually about money. Um, and that's why you even see these hyperscale providers are using service providers now. They're not building their own data centers. It's also true. But that, wouldn't you say the, the evolution of the hyperscale and colo provider, I mean, that, look what's happened in the last five, seven, eight years. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's driven different approaches in, in how to construct, how to operate, um, and that's driven that cost down. Right, but I mean, we've we, we've bumped along the bottom. I mean, I, Chris, I love your perspective. Obviously, and anyone else, but like, we're all bouncing on the bottom of the curve at this point in time. Like, you right. can't get much a more efficient. Yeah, I mean, I mean yeah. it's asymptotic to a number, right? I mean, you're going to hit that, and you're going to get asymptotic to it, and and you know, it's just going to. You might get a little bit more, but the incremental efficiency is so much more costly that you stop innovating because you can't get to if where you, you go need to, to go. If you go to the Japanese principle of the pokayoke, right? The the how do I mistake proof? You actually mm -hmm. try to invest a little bit more because you now you're trying to reduce your least common denominator, which is people mistakes, which is what causes the outage. So you drive down to a point, you take it up a little bit in order to simplify and and ease operation. Basically, what we've seen with our customer bases as we've dealt with the larger hyperscale, they're actually so sophisticated from a consumer perspective. They're asking us to remove components that aren't necessary for their design architecture to drive the cost down to get them a more efficient frontier. I mean, all of our design documents for our new generation six data center we're building in Phoenix, we sent the documents it's out to plug. all of them. What's that? No, it's not plug at all. No, but we sent the design documents out to all of the hyperscale providers and took comments. Like, like why am I gonna, you know, they're gonna tell me what they need in the design for resiliency and that's gonna be more than sufficient for my co-location business. And the retail Capital side. finds its most efficient. Yeah, exactly path. right. It come, may come down to an application level challenge, managing the application code and deploying over the wire. Yeah. You can do software updates on a Tesla, but there's not millions of them out in the field yet. So. The use case we're seeing for the edge is, is both a latency and capacity constraint, right? So opening the garage door remotely from a data center in Dallas isn't the, you know, the, I, that's a spot on, but when it's doing a 4K, 30 second facial recognition video right. that's being sent someplace to be processed and analyzed and send back the decision to open the door or not open the door based on the, that is a much more, you know, one millisecond isn't the issue, it's the amount of data being transmitted and the distance it needs to go to get processed. And with, so, I mean, the use case, what we're seeing with our customers, and to the point about edge data centers, I mean, what 
Crown's doing and what we're endeavoring to do as well is to provide co-location services at these edge sites, right? So whether at a utility substation or at a tower location. So again, someone doesn't have to go acquire these themselves. They can just like they do in the core days in our world, they can go acquire a cabinet. They can acquire 10 cabinets. They can acquire what they need on a footprint that meets their requirements. So. Um, I think from our perspective, it's like the old days of the internet. A good friend of mine once said, you know, why bandwidth, bandwidth's valuable where it's not, right? Not very valuable inside of switches, meet me room in Vegas, right? Because there's thousands of options. It's incredibly valuable in the middle of the Sahara Desert, right? You'll pay $4 a megabit to use a uh, satellite phone. Similarly, the constraint that we've seen and with our customers and, and you know, I assume is similar is capacity tied with latency how can I get this much data processed and back in a given period of time is what's driving majority of the compute requirements we're seeing in, in different edge locations. So that's a great uh, segue. I want to switch up how we were going to end this. Originally, it was going to be kind of a capstone. Uh, now that we have so eloquently defined the edge, as in not at all, <laughs> <laughs> which, is, which is fine, because this really was more about are we even asking the right questions? Are we moving in the right direction? So I'd like to ask you, and we'll start at this end, because Chris was so abused uh, at the beginning. Um, <laughs> and you really just touched on it, George, and that is what are the drivers? What are the, what are we looking at? We keep talking about how many zettabytes of data we're using globally, which is re a relatively meaningless idea unless you bring it down to a use case, right? unless you bring it down to, to an application area, uh, a technology set. So what are the drivers for the edge? What do we need to be looking for? What do, where are the biggest opportunities and where are the hurdles? And just kind of take that whole cloth. And so I'll start with you, Chris. All right, so I mean, I gotta echo a point that Eddie made. We make hammers and saws and screwdrivers um, is what we do. It's not that sexy anymore. It used to be for a very brief period of time. <laughs> We, you know, glorified power outlets, glorified pieces of fiber. I mean, it's not. I've been listening to you say the same thing for. It's, it's it's not that complicated. It's a fan on a circuit on a and, power outlet. And we become, you know, it, we're, we're tools ultimately that that get used. And so, from an edge perspective, I don't know. I mean, if it's a hammer used to build a skyscraper, it's a hammer used to build a house. It's still a hammer. Um, at the end of the day, is kind of my viewpoint. I think. Uh, so there's some pretty big hurdles. I didn't really answer that question because um, we didn't get time for that. But I think the, just I'll, I'll make this comment. Ubiquity of connectivity is a key factor, I think, um, for edge success and also for the future. And I'm not really defining how that gets achieved. It can be done on free bandwidth. But you know, there's limits in spectrum on 5G. There's limits in you know, bandwidth capabilities on any radio device, and there's limits in bandwidth connectivity in our, on our uh, land-based tele, teleconnected systems. So ubiquity of network, I think, is or connectivity is gonna be key. I think the other thing that's gonna drive, um, frankly, it's gonna drive edge value is um, databases in general today still have not improved enough from a speed and, and storage perspective in order to eliminate the human factor res, you know, resistance to you know, latency. And so uh, it's surprisingly funny because, uh, and I don't want to spend too much time on this, but when, when, when I go to grandma and grandpa's, right, they have DSL and my kids all freak out about how slow that is. And of course, at home we have like 300 you know, megs. And so it's kind of surprising to me how human factors have changed because I can remember when I was a teen using 300 baud modems to connect to, you know, to the quote internet at that time. So I guess it's my alive. my point in this is that, um, you know, again this comes back to end user experiences. Right now the majority of edge type services are content based. And most of that's for entertainment purposes. I would suspect that as we as IoT becomes more important to us that we'll see some level of localized compute requirement that has to occur. 
and maybe some AI and decision practices that have to occur along with telemetry communications across the network. So I think ubiquity and database capability, the, the search and the lookup capability um, for any device or person is gonna determine how, how big and how adopted the edge will have to be. I just added that, I mean, the, I think we said earlier on, I just kind of resummarize. I think the user, user will dictate. Um, I think cost is, cost is king. I think uh, you, know, you look at what behavior that has driven, what behavior will drive going forward, and that's um, you know, more and more of a, a meld between what is infrastructure, what is network, what is compute, what is real estate, uh, what is security. It will begin to meld these things into, if you want to call them appliances, or you know, where does the where does the uh, IT end and the, the infrastructure begin? I think you'll begin to see more and more of this becoming a system. Um, that drives behaviors within companies. The companies who, who um, align and understand and communicate those visions internally uh, will be the ones who adopt and, and um, are successful in the end. Well, I'll just repeat what I already said, but I mean, our, where we're actually delivering edge capacity to customers, our 98% of it has to do with the, you know, the, as I described, the, the ratio of content capa you know, capacity and, and latency, um, whether it's, you know, a trading application or it's a video distribution or processing or, you know, on down the list of things, that's the, that's the magic bullet right now is how can I get this much capacity this close to something for some reason and that's why they moved to the edge. Yeah. Bruce, was the question what applications do we think are going to drive the edge? The <laughs> Yeah, I, so um, I think some of the things are going to drive the edge in the near term, right? And we've already started seeing it as carrier CRAN deployments. And that can underwrite the localization of compute because it helps take cost out of the network and provides more flexibility. But one of the most interesting use cases that I've seen, and I've been looking at this for a while, right? Everybody knows about autonomous cars is uh, drones. I think drones are gonna come, come about a lot faster than the cars. I think there's a lot uh, lower barrier to entry and I think the use cases uh, from drones are, are pretty plentiful and pretty exciting and the amount of data, and to George's point, it's, it's about capacity and latency combined. And to me, the, the, the use cases on drones seem, seem to be right around the corner on, on um, in terms of things that will, will drive that latency and capacity needs? Um, two kinds of data that, that will drive the edge. The first kind of data is the data that requires mobility to derive its value. Um, the other kind, like drones and, and connect the car. The other kind is the data that was with expiration date. Um, there was a recent example that uh, the, the, one of the, the largest uh, cloud provider, Alibaba, set up a, a trial smart city in their home, t home city of Hangzhou. <coughs> if everybody that gone to China, any size of city, you realize that the pollution, the congestion is killing people. I mean, we're not, we're not talking about life, we're talking about people's lives being impacted. So there's a lot of money being spent, and they literally put in a smart city edge data or whatever edge to collect data, collect information, and adjust traffic patterns. They were able to save 20, 15 to 20 percent on the busy hour congestion time. That is that's value. What drives it? There is aspect of yes, capital always finds efficiency. But at a certain point, you got to look back and uh, we are humans. We got to make our lives better, <coughs> make our children's life better. So connect the car is, is, is one. So data, data that has these mobility to move chunks and chunks of data from, from uh, data center to data center. So the longer static, you've got to move. The other kind is, uh, is data with expiration. If you don't process it now and then, it's meaningless. You might as well just throw it away. I think those two will, not the only, but those two will, will stand out. And you will either get funding from, from the government, get funding from, from us, or, or somebody will realize this is for, for, for the good of society. Let me look up my notes, Bruce. Yeah, right. I'm just kidding. 
but <laughs> but by 2020, I mean, I look at it two, three, two, three technologies. Uh, by 2020, I think I'm bullish on industrial IoT because I see it growing massively from whatever I've seen. Um, augmented reality and virtual reality are in the are not in the maturity curve and mass adoption where they are, but they will undoubtedly also be one of the drivers. I would say that's like 2022 maybe. And, and then around the same time frame in AR, we are come real, they will open up a whole bunch of opportunities with the healthcare example you were going, there are doctors wanting to remotely operate a patient and a bunch of doctors from different parts looking and when, when the patient incision, incision is taking place and it's a critical surgery. Now you have real time collaboration with six experts on the, on the planet at the same time. You will need edge for that. Uh, and the third is what I was doing with this thing was the minority report thing, you know, the haptic computing type of stuff where a touch interface is combined into your fingertips and now you are opening and closing documents like you see in the movies. The person of interest is the movie that always gets me going and I've been quoting it for the last 10 years, believe it or not. But that's a movie that combines everything, audio, video, surveillance, facial recognition, and it has many edges. Just look at that movie and look at the number of edges you see all over the place. Which movie again? Person of, the TV show, Person of Interest. Oh, Person of Interest. Person of Interest, TV show, not the movie, I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. And then the movie is Minority Report and Tom Cruise. I knew you, that's what I thought you were. That, that's the one, really. <laughs> you have to look at it again. Right. Those are my three, top three. So I'm right with you on IoT. I think as you, as you get better aggregation of all of these disparate data sources, we're going to start to make correlations that were never visible before because they were coming in, in such siloed you know, uh, studies that you, you, know, you only tried to refine this component and you didn't look at how the other things were impacting it. So I think as you broaden your data sources, I think we're gonna start to really tap into the potential of our resources, of our infrastructure, and of our capabilities, whether it's software program, whether it's you know, machines, um, and you add in like augmented reality, virtual reality, and it really starts to get crazy. But I still think from a, an edge and an IoT perspective, we, there's going to be another huge leap. There's, there's a black swan out there that we haven't seen yet, right? We're, we're just scratching the surface of how do we do what we do today better? A lot of people talked about how do we just use this to improve, but... Law enforcement. Right, yeah, yeah. I mean, right, you think about, you talk about facial recognition, right? We, all, all of these technologies exist, but we haven't actually gone out and said if you, if you cross-pollinate all these different fields, and again, you know, Malcolm Gladwell, if you look at, you know, you get an economist to kind of look at this, not from the perspective of law enforcement or from IoT, but let's just look at where the data takes us. I think that's gonna, there's gonna be this moment that happens that transforms what we do. Um, and one of the challenges I do see is there's such a diffusity of, of use cases, right? Like we kept talking about edge and it's dependent on this and it's dependent on that and it's dependent on what do we call, it's so hard to get standards and those synergies of you know, economies of scale and shared learning because they are so specific oftentimes to a specific use case. So you know, it's gonna take adoption and people pushing the boundaries of, of how they deploy these. So Bruce, I'm trying to go you know, forward thinking for you, get us out of the past. Um, and the one thing I guess from an edge perspective, considering that it's my job now, is I've been in the data center business now almost 20 years and it's been very cyclic, so we may just get to the point where we think we're heading in the right direction and we're gonna cycle back because we're gonna have an event and we're all gonna be laughing about, oh, we were talking about Edge five years ago, now we're doing the next new thing. So, you know, I'll, I'll change my title accordingly as that changes. <laughs> <laughs> Love that. Yeah, and that's the thing. Sometimes you can predict the future based on what's going on now and then suddenly something will happen like, uh, you know, this yeah. or a Facebook that is so, transformative and disruptive. Who thought of a Facebook in 1980? You know what I mean? And yet now it's transforming literally everyday lives. It's just transforming nation states. So sometimes uh, the path of innovation isn't a straight path. Well, Julie, you were the last thing preventing us from getting to beer and to talk about <laughs> the That's a terrible thing. <laughs> uh, I found this fascinating. Thank you. This is a great contribution. We had a terrific audience here, and the online streaming audience was uh, bigger, and uh, some really interesting people out there listen to you. So thank you for your contribution, and uh, we're going to be 
uh, replaying this in the future, repurposing it, uh, and doing webinars around it. So, And the topic for the leadership roundtables in New York will be smart cities. So it'll be the, an evolution of this. So, thank you very much. Thank you, amazing panelists. Thank you. Thank you all.